you switched your tense in there, didn't you? Uh, uh, from first person to third a, a couple times? Yeah, I did. No, okay. I did. And I, I uh, the most egregious examples of that were edited away. I had... Uh, I think it's good. Yeah, I had a... Uh, the, the, the first paragraph of the book was in present tense, and then it immediately shifted into past tense. And I turned the novel in, turned the manuscript into Tin House, and thought, they were, oh, they're going to immediately notice that. And they didn't. And I, I thought, well, yeah, I'm pretty good. I did that seamlessly, <laughs> you know. Uh, we did a second round of comments. Again, they didn't notice it. Or if they did, they didn't say anything. And then the third one came back and they said, do you know how the first paragraph is in present tense and the rest of that first chapter is in past tense? And I said, yeah, I'm doing that on purpose. And, and I gave this rationale that was really something that I'd made up after the fact. <laughs> really, I was doing it to show off. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, can, I, I, mean I, I bet you I can do it. As a charity case street musician has an electric guitar, no amp, chops out purple haze wildly and soundlessly, complete with vibrato you can see but not hear. Throwing his kisses skyward, just like the movie, while down the street, three dark-suited businessmen and a black woman with fierce eyes await the bus, quitting time, heading home. And then after those two quitting time, heading homes, we're into past. And I was so proud. I mean, I'll be able to do that till the day I die, because I, 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 that's so ingrained. And I'm talking with my editor, who's a brilliant guy, Tony, uh, Tony Perez at, at Tin House Books. And he said, well, yeah, I see what you're doing, and I understand your rationale, but you know, you're a first-time author, not every, you got to be comfortable with the fact that not everybody will get it. And I started imagining the, you know, this review that was headlined, first-time author struggles with tense. <laughs> and I thought, it's not worth it. And, and I started, and, I, and then I re, rewrote that paragraph in past tense. Every time I read it now in past tense, I stumble over it because the present tense one is just hardwired in here. That's good. I, I enjoyed the switch. Yeah. Uh, now, are you working on any short stories, or have you done short stories? I've done stories? some short stories. Um, I need to go back to them and give them a look, but I, I have a half a dozen of them that I'm pretty happy with. And getting the collection together mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, do any poetry? None that I would ever show anyone. <laughs> short narrative, uh, like your short stories. And yeah. Short stories. yeah. Um, this tour I'm kind of curious about. I, I know. Well, I don't know about Tin House and how, what kind of money they have. I only know that they put out a beautiful product. I like a lot of the authors they have in there. And uh, are, are, did they pay for any of that? I mean, that's none of my business. Do you have, there's so much self-promotion these days. If you're not, you know, yeah. Steinbeck or yeah. Vonnegut, yeah. You, you have to run your own car. Is yeah. that what you're doing? Yeah, you know, a lot of this is, is inexpensive because I lived here. I have friends in almost every city I've gone to. so. You know, I don't have a lot of lodging expenses. It's really the airplane ticket and the rental car. And I just, I went to them and said, what's, you know, what's the budget for promoting? And they said, well, make us a pitch, you know, tell us, tell us what you think you should do. And it just seemed obvious. It's set in Michigan. I should, I should be taking it to Michigan. So. Now, after Michigan, that's, you, you're kind of on your own or? I've you got uh, six or seven more uh, meetings and signings in Oregon probably through the fall. Well, that's great. Uh, now, but you're, did you pick your sites here? Or did they have some say in this? I, I went to uh, Christina Riggle's website and Bonnie Jo Campbell's website and, and, and looked where they were going. Oh, okay. And then I emailed Christina and said, I don't know you and you don't know me, but what are the good stores to go to? And started getting a list. And uh, and then, you know, emailed other, including you, other people that I knew were involved in, in the writing community and said, where should I be? So it was, no, it was, uh, I had to kind of do my own research. Yeah, well, I'm yeah. glad you did. I thought Bonnie's sick, John. <laughs> no. <laughs> now you have to put Scott's store on, the, on, the, on your map for the future. Absolutely. Um, I usually have many, many more uh, questions, and I'm afraid I, I don't. Anybody I would else? like to. May I ask? Yes, I'm sure. an old Jackson person. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, you look uh huh. It could be. Yeah. Wow. Graduated from high school there in '62. I was editor of the high school newspaper, and so. But Jackson High, probably. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, what were you, when you say a couple miles out of town? Uh, Strathmore Road off Kibbe. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Yes, I know where that was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I lived out in a trailer in Parma for a while. Oh, so yeah. Fun. 
Yes, and what college did you... Um... So I went to Antioch College Antioch. in Southern Ohio. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. Well, I was just wondering about those Jackson roots, because it's... Uh... Yeah. You know, Jackson in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, you've got everything, everything seemed to be happening somewhere else. Yes. You know, there was Woodstock, there was a summer of love, there was all this excitement in the air, and the one thing you knew is it's not happening here in Jackson. <laughs> and, uh, and so all my friends, they went east, uh, north, or west. And uh, um, now I think when I go back there, it seems like a much different city to me. Um, but boy, during the time as a teenager, the, the idea was to make a plan and go somewhere. Their motto was Jackson, the city of action, which I always thought was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. no. no, I don't think so. But I teach journalism at Michigan State, and what I was interested in asking you actually was that part of the challenge, I think, for journalism students nowadays is to learn how to tell a narrative. Yeah. Because I don't think, I mean, to me, reporting the news, that's sort of the raw material that anybody can do with a flip camera and they can just put it up and tweet about it. Um, so nowadays, if you really want to make your career as a journalist, don't. how can we teach them the storytelling aspect? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can we liberate them into, into doing more of that? I think that's a really hard, that for me was the hardest skill to learn. And, I, and it was the hardest thing to get feedback on. Uh, you know, a lot of people can give you feedback on the words you've put on a paper. and, and you know, as a, as a writer trying to teach myself, I've put a collection of words on a, on a piece of paper and they're not the right words. And just to talk about that, well, it's helpful in a way. It took me a long time to find teachers, people who could see the story that was sort of the invisible half-formed story that was hovering over the page and talk about it in a way that wasn't directive but that allowed me to see it and see where it could go. And see where it could go. Um, that's a special skill. That's not something that most people have, at least in my experience. Um, I, I signed up for this, I joined this writer's group in 2002 thinking, I've been in writer's groups before, I don't, I don't need another writer's group, but I'll give these guys a few months. And I was there for five years, uh, every Thursday night, uh, reading a portion of my, of my book and then bringing it back in. And, uh, that's, I think that's really where, I, that was my MFA program, you know, the, the Portland Writers Group. It's called the Pinewood Table for anybody in Portland. Um, just an amazing uh, uh, group and good teachers. Stephen Allred and Joanna Rose. Plans to come back to Michigan at all? Well, uh, there is probably going to be another Bob Seeger tour in the fall or winter, so I'll be back for that. Um, and I'd like to probably do some more events, some meetings or signings around that time too. So, I mean, I'm never gone for much more than a year at most, and sometimes I'm here a couple times a year. Do you have another novel in the works? I do. I, I uh, you know, got to a point with Wire to Wire where it seemed like it had a lot of complexities, and the complexities seemed like good things to me as, a, as, as part of the novel, but they, were, they made it hard to pitch. You know, there's five point of view characters. There's things going on with time where it doesn't run chronologically all the time. There's uh, a frame story around it. And so to try to, and everybody says, you know, you've got to grab somebody's attention in three pages. You've got to be able to pitch it in, in 60 seconds or maybe 30 seconds. You just can't do that with wire to wire. And at a certain point I thought, I've got to, this is going to be a hard book to publish as my first book. So I thought I needed to write something a little more conventional as the first book. And so I, I wrote the first draft of that. It's another kind of a crime novel, similar in, in style to Wire to Wire, but a little simpler. So first draft of that is done, and I just need to, I need to look at that and see if that's still what I want to do next. Well, you know, you're writing a, a new, a sort of a, not a new genre, but a genre that Bonnie Jo Campbell, Don Shan, uh, Dennis, was it Dennis Woodrow, this outside writing about yeah. outsiders, people at the fringe of life. Yeah. yeah. And what attracted you to that? A couple of things. I, I I know I was influenced by a story by Charlie Smith. Uh, I believe it's called Crystal River, and it was in the Paris Review a long time ago. And his his poetry also uh, often deals with 
those kinds of characters. And I began to think, as I, as I started, you know, as a very beginning writer putting characters on the page, the ones that stuck, the ones that were interesting, were the ones who had pretty strong flaws that they had to struggle against. And I, I never developed an interest in the, the kind of novel, um, I mean, I like reading novels that, where you meet characters and they seem normal, they got good jobs and nice families and their lives seem good and then you kind of peel back the layers. The author peels back the layers and you realize, oh, underneath all that normalcy, they've got serious problems. I, as a reader, I enjoy that. As a writer, that never, um, that never kept me filling up pages. And so I, I just think I was drawn to these characters whose flaws are just right out there, you know, from the moment you meet them. Are they and, easier to find in Michigan? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. They're all. Think so. And what? What's we, I'm sorry. We compared Bonnie, uh, Joel Campbell, to uh, it's a Catholic writer. Uh, Flannery. 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 Yeah. Flannery. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if that had any influence, or you know, like, we don't like to always find influence, but that was an easy one to find. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you can't hit a false note with that, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. You really need to know those Some people attraction. and understand them and have compassion for them. They're yeah. not butterflies on a pin. Yeah. Well, I did an interview with a, a radio interview uh, last week with a person who was a former prosecutor who said, I've prosecuted every one of your characters. <laughs> <laughs> I know who these people are. <laughs> well, I thought it was rich. I, yeah. I really did. Well, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. What are your impressions of Michigan now that you've been away and now that you're older and you look back? What changes do you see? What do you see when you come back? Well, in my, in my hometown in Jackson, it, it seems to me either I'm just no longer seeing it through that, that kind of alienated teenager's eyes or else there is a little greater sense of optimism and of, of, of the, you know, that things can happen there and it can be a, a fun place to live. Um, Northern Michigan, you know, the reason I like it up there so much is that it, a lot of it has not changed. Some of it, certainly there are areas up there that are a lot more uh, crowded and there's more of kind of the franchise and tourist element in places, but you don't have to go very far and it's pretty much the same as when I first started going up there. And that's what appeals to me. And, and so I tend, to, I tend to like the towns that haven't prospered very much. A Wire to Wire is set in a, in a town that I call Wolverine. There really is a Wolverine, but my Wolverine is, is much more based on Frankfurt and Alberta, where the big car ferries go across. And Frankfurt is a pretty, you know, that town is pretty crowded with tourists most of the summer. Alberta, boy, there's a bar, there's a coffee shop, um, there's still a lot of empty space. It, at least in my memory, looks a lot like it used to look 20 years ago. And uh, it's a fun place. I mean, that's where I like to go when I'm there. Do you have a personal story that you could share with us about jumping the rails or the train? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I started uh, because my high school buddy was, uh, this, this was during the draft era and when they were doing lottery numbers and he got a really low lottery number, like eight or something. And he said, man, if I'm gonna be drafted, I'm gonna, I wanna have some fun, let's go hop some trains. And I had a high number, but you know, he was my friend and he, he wanted to go, so, so we took off. We went from, we started just riding around Michigan in Durand and uh, rode, from Frank, uh, rode from Ann Arbor up to Frankfurt on the Ann Arbor Railroad. We got up there and, we, and I, I had seen the big railroad ferries that cross Lake Michigan. I mean, you, you could put an entire freight train on those ferries. Uh, a 40 car, you know, a 40 car train would fit on there. But you could also ride them as a passenger. And I knew what it cost, my buddy didn't. He said, man, I, I bet that cost a hundred dollars to ride that thing. And I knew it was eight dollars, but uh, I always wish I'd, you know, bought his ticket for him. Uh, <laughs> but then we rode across and we, uh, for a while I lived in Minneapolis. You could hop a train in Minneapolis uh, and be in Seattle two and a half days later. Same train. And I did that once. I did that multiple times because it was just an easy shot. Most of the times when we rode freights, we didn't care where we were going. But if I wanted to get out to the west coast, I would, I would take that train. One time I took it, got off north of Seattle, uh, was just covered with soot and went immediately to a, a laundromat where there was another guy my age 
also doing his laundry and I was kind of bragging to him saying, yeah, I just, I just came in on the freight from Minneapolis. And he said, yeah, me too, which car were you in? I mean, it was, <laughs> it was well known that you, could, that you could get that train. Uh, mostly though, we just went out and we, and we rode whatever train was leaving next, wherever it was going. Our, our plan back then was save up $500, $600 during the winter, quit our jobs, and spend three months uh, riding freight, seeing parts of the country. You know, this was an era when I, we, we were done with college and all my friends were either, my perspective was everybody went out and got a job or went to law school. And, and both of those things seemed like bad choices to me. And so we just went out and we rode trains. The kind of coincidental of the funny thing is, my friend, who, uh, who was the one with the low draft number, who said, come on, let's do this. Uh, let's go ride, ride some freight trains. He really taught me how to do it. He had an instinct for trains. He could, he, he could sense in a yard where you ought to go. He, he uh, was, just had a lot of skills and, and uh, instincts for, for riding freight. And I was kind of following, learning from him. He became, and still is, the editor of a small paper in Oregon. And so he, he actually has written two memoirs uh, about our trips together. One is called The Crowbar Hotel. We were, in, we were in Canada once and we got thrown off the train by a, a constable who said, I'm gonna, you guys get caught here again, you're gonna end up in the Crowbar Hotel, which was his name for jail, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, and then his other book, uh, Travelogue for an Unruly Youth. So he, he's written a couple of memoirs that he would claim tell the true story of what I've fictionalized in the book, although we argue about that sometimes. Is his name Jim Hunter? No, his name is uh, Jesse Burkhart.